I'll leave it at this one. This, this will be the last image because this beautifully shows the parallelism and how elegantly elliptical they are. Right. Yep. And there's another feature, and this is what we'll explore. They all have more, the most prominent rims to the southeast. Yes, that's right. And, and so when I was looking at the bays, you know, as you can see, I think maybe I'll – yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah. Okay, I, I've added axes to those. Now, the theory of the celestials was that this represented atmospheric flight paths of bolides entering the atmosphere. Because before the efforts to basically bring the whole argument back to the earth and explain it in uniformitarian terms, the idea that had evolved post Melton and Shriver actually involved more of a, what would you say, a storm of Tunguska-like events. And several of those, and, th and this is what we'll get into uh, in more detail, involved actually aerial bursts rather than impacts. So it may have been a combination of impacts. It may have been a combination of aerial bursts. Um, but in any case, whether that was, whether it turns out that it's, it's celestial in origin, my thinking was, and this is, again, going back to the late 80s and early 90s, is that, well, if these long axes represent flight paths, what happens if you project those to try to see the, the entry path of the, this presumably swarm of disintegrated, perhaps, comet nuclei material coming into the atmosphere? And the first thing I realized was, well, it would have carried it right over the Laurentide ice sheet. Yes. So my next thing of thinking was, was I drew a path following this alignment right here, which is just about 45 degrees to the northwest. It led over not only the Laurentide ice sheet, but over the Cordilleran ice sheet as well. So then I thought, well, let's have a look and see what we see in terms of anything unusual or extreme occurring to the ice sheet about this time. And I might mention also that the Carolina Bays, at this point, radio, by, by the 50s, radiocarbon dating had come online. And so you were having core samples taken of the bays. Now, when, when they did the subsurface surveys, what they discovered was that the bottom of the bays is this kind of unusual, almost like hard packed, it was described by some of the researchers as baked clay, right? Mm -hmm. and, and of course, it was this baked clay that formed almost the bottom of these elliptical bowls, right? But in most cases, over that, and they called it, the term was humate that they used it to, to describe this kind of unusual, dense, almost baked clay that formed the bottom of the, of the, of the base. But over there was a lot of peat and, and sedimentary accumulation that they had to core through. But what that meant was that by extracting cores, you could find, you know, abundant organic material in those cores and that material could be dated and over and over and over again the oldest dates that were coming up were terminal ice age you know nobody's mentioning it back then but if you go back and look at it you're seeing that it's coming up younger dryas age you know the dates were coming up 11 12,000 years 13,000 years right in there over and over again so that led the researchers to think that well they were all pretty much produced at the same time. These, these weren't things that were, you know, forming, you know, over long periods of time where, you know, one might be forming and then it's halfway formed and then a new one starts forming. It, what it appeared was that they all formed simultaneously. And so that's part of the mystery, you know, which to me again leads back to, I still don't see the a, a, a plausible theory that relies exclusively on terrestrial processes, right? It still seems to me, and when we'll get into this, we are, we're definitely going to get into this. We're going to look in detail. For example, we will look in detail at impacts and what they do under various circumstances. We will look in detail at the events surrounding the Tunguska event of 1908, once we are armed with that information, whatever insight we get to that, we'll come back to the base. And then we will look at that. We will look at the updated controversies. And yeah, then we'll, we'll leave it to the listener to see what they think. You know, I, at this point, lean towards a celestial explanation only because 
I haven't seen anything that's exclusively terrestrial or gradualistic that can explain these things. So where does that leave us? Maybe, maybe we can get some of the, you know, maybe I'm sure Tony Zamora would be happy to come on and talk to us about his ice boulder hypothesis. Yeah. That's um, one of my favorites. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we could certainly do that. Well, I let's, think. let's visit that briefly though, because he, he attributes that to an impact in the Saginaw Bay of, you know, the mitten of Michigan. It, is there, yeah. is there any evidence out there that says that's a recent impact site? Oblique. Um, not that I know of other than, other than topolo topogra topologically, it, it, you know, it, it has the, the, it has, it's a basin, you know, it, the problem is, is that the, the, the theory that we're looking at now is that there were impacts into the ice sheet itself. And th this is, this is where I went, you know, I, not knowing a whole lot about this, you know, 25 and 30 years ago, once I discovered this or, or came upon the idea that the entry path for, for the Carolina Bay, if, if, if it was a celestial, if it was a fragmentation type event, if, if Earth encountered a swarm of stuff, and it, okay, and, it, and, and, and we can look at the, the, the multiple evidence that suggests the, the flight path was from the Northwest. If it comes over the ice sheet, and this is where, where, where Tony's idea is coming from, is that the impact into the ice sheet, you know, the, 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 the um, breccia that's thrown up in this case is going to be pieces, big chunks of ice instead of rock that, that's raining back down. And I know that that idea has been challenged by Malcolm LeCompte. I don't know w exactly what Malcolm LeCompte's specific objections are, but I know he, he, he disagrees with that. But um, I don't know. I'm still, I, I would still lean towards, and, and once you see this, when we start looking in more detail at Tunguska, there actually is elliptical swamps yeah. in, the, in, in the region of Tunguska that were probably not there before the thing happened. So th that's why I'm leaning towards a massive swarm of, of stuff coming in. But that doesn't mean that there couldn't have been, um, that, that that swarm might have been more like a sat satellites. You know, it might have been the entourage that was accompanying much larger pieces. And if these pieces splayed out over the ice sheet and hit the ice sheet, I think the, the most, to me, the, the explanation that we need to be looking at now is evidence that there were multiple impacts into the ice sheet. 